So we are live again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure. It's a big pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Clare uh, from Queen University of London and also York University. She's currently on a transition between the two places. Like she may, might be able to talk better about this, like in the conversation, follow up conversation. Uh, she research her research uh, considers biodiversity at all levels, from molecular evolution to ecosystem function and food web structure. She employs novel genomic techniques to focus on the evolution and recognition of species and the connections between species and trophic levels. The evolution of interactions has many repercussions for conservation. She tracks also, she uses these methods to track food webs in both tropical and temperate systems to investigate ecosystem function and evolution. She has constructed and compared uh, food webs among fruitivores, insectivores, and pollinators in both tropical and, trop and temperate uh, environments and work in many different countries, including Canada, US, Jamaica, Costa Rica, Belize, UK, and the list is still growing. Uh, it's a big pleasure to have her here as she was my PhD supervisor, which I'm very thankful to have worked with her and been having done a lot of research under her supervision. And she's also one of the main speakers of the course. And I for sure wouldn't be able to be here talking, uh, organizing a course about molecular ecology with you if it was not because of her. So it's a big pleasure to have you here Dr. Elizabeth Clare, talking about the development of uh, barcoding for ecological analysis. Thanks, Hernani. And I'm really pleased to try and do this via YouTube. This is the first time I've ever done a YouTube webcast. So this is a new experience. Um, as Hernani said, I, I'm going to try and give you a bit of a historical overview of how I started as a taxonomist and have sort of um, my career has developed to become an ecologist through the, the lens of DNA barcoding, something that I came upon by accident. Um, and I, I know you've, you've already had some talks from some of the other students in my research group um, who her nanny was um, a student with. So I, I'm going to try not to repeat what, what they talked about, but give you a sort of an idea of how this field has developed. And end by showing you what I think is happening next. Um, as Hernani said, I've, I've been in the UK for the last decade um, at, at Queen Mary, but I'm actually have just moved back to Canada and I'm starting a, a professorship at uh, the York University in Toronto. So my talk today is in three parts. I want to introduce where barcoding came from. Almost everybody in biology has now heard of barcoding but the motivation behind it has, has sometimes become lost. Um, I wanna tell you a, a sort of a personal story of how for me barcoding became ecology. And then I wanna talk about the future um, and the environmental DNA work that is just starting in the last couple of weeks. So most of our system of taxonomy is roughly 250 years old and begins um, really formally with Carl Linnaeus. And prior to that, there were many different taxonomic systems. There's been taxonomy in, in place for thousands of years, as long as humans have needed to name species. But it was formalized under Linnaeus, um, really starting with plants and then with animals. And the idea at the time was that an ability to talk about species using a universal scientific language um, was required and that the, the project of naming species is something that Linnaeus thought he might be able to accomplish within a few years. The reality is that in the intervening 250, 300 years, um, we haven't even come close to naming all the things on the planet. And what we've really recognized in the last 50 years is what we call the species problem. And this is basically described by this figure. In, since the time of Linnaeus, we have named about 1.7 million species of plant and animal, and that's a vague estimate. We're not actually sure how many names are out there. And in the diagram that I've got here, roughly shows you where that diversity is located. So the vast majority of names are attached to insects, quite a lot are attached to flowering and then other plant groups, and smaller numbers are connected to things like vertebrates and spiders and crustaceans and mollusks. But the species problem is that we now estimate that the total biodiversity of the planet is somewhere between 10 and 100 million species currently existing. 
And the first problem is that the best biodiversity scientists on the planet can't tell you within an order of magnitude where that number is. So they don't really know if it's closer to 10 million or 100 million species. And there are plenty of people who will tell you as they think it's actually more than 100 million. And the second species problem is that if it's 10 million, the smaller of those estimates, then what we know becomes this tiny little box in the bottom. And what we don't know is this medium level box. And in fact, if the number is closer to 100 million species, then what we know is a very, very tiny portion of what actually exists. Um, and I like to tell my, my students a lot of the time that what we don't know is basically everything. And that in 300 years, we haven't come close to achieving Linnaeus's goal. And so almost 20 years ago now, it seems hard to believe that probably for a lot of the students in the audience, barcoding has existed for most of your life. The idea of using DNA to identify species was a really new concept 20 years ago. There were some attempts within the bacterial and the viral world in particular to engage in what they called DNA taxonomy. There were a few people who were advocating it, particularly for things like beetles um, and some of the, uh, the other insect groups. But DNA wasn't a primary method of identifying species in most of the animal groups and most of the plant groups. It was still based primarily on morphology. There were lots of people beginning to use DNA, but there was no universal system for using it. So DNA barcoding in the strictest sense of the word was an attempt to standardize what was happening in different disciplines where different people were using different genes and different ways of using DNA to try and aid their taxonomic system. And the metaphor of a barcode comes from the, the black and white codes you see on lots of products, which are called universal product codes. Those black and white stripes are actually coding for a numerical system that allows you to scan the code and access a database that tells you everything you need to know about that product, including how much it will cost you when you try to buy it at a shop. Um, a barcode, a DNA barcode, was metaphorically designed to do the same thing. The idea being that you could look at a tiny fragment of DNA and that if you sequenced it, it should link you to a database of all the information you'd want to know about that species. Its taxonomy was part of that, but the other idea was that you would digitize its ecology, that we would know everything about the species and anybody anywhere should be able to use it like a, a, like a field guide, a paper book, to identify what it was and learn about it. And so it was first conceptualized as a sort of colorful illustrative barcode based on the A's, C's, T's, and G's that make up DNA rather than just the, the black and white of a universal product code. Um, and you need quite a lot more DNA um, to actually get enough variability in the regions that they picked to identify species. But what they recognized in the early part of the century was that you needed about 650 base pairs of mitochondrial DNA, particularly the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, to give you enough variability that you could identify most animal species on, on, on Earth. It didn't work so well for plants. You need a different set of markers. And subsequently, different markers have been identified for things like fungi, for protists, and for some of the more parasitic life, there are different genes that are being used. But for most animal life, the cytochrome oxidase 1 region, particularly this 650 base pair stretch of it, works pretty well. It can differentiate species. And when we say differentiate species, what we generally mean is that if you took all the members that are closely related, here's a, a group of primates, and you sequence just the same universal stretch of DNA from each of them, and you build a tree, in this case, it's just a neighbor joining tree, um, you should be able to see individual species clustering on the end of a branch, very, very different from other members of other species. And so in this diagram here, you've got um, humans at the top, and all humans are relatively similar at this region, but we're very, very different than say the gorillas or the chimpanzees. And in fact, you can see the two different groups of chimpanzees, and then you can go further out and see all the different primates um, at the end of a branch, very, very different from other members of the group primate. And this was replicated the same sort of analysis in many, many different groups. And it was actually very, very controversial at the start and had a whole lot of resistance from many different areas of the research community who did not believe this would work. 
Um, I was part of this in the first sort of two years when it was established. I began working in DNA barcoding in 2004. The first papers were published in 2003. So I, I, was a, I was a PhD student during most of that very, very controversial first five or six years. Um, and there were some, some very, very strong arguments against doing this and for some relatively good reasons. But by and large, it does work. And I don't want to get into the arguments for and against barcoding. There's a, a very long literature that shows the arguments um, that were, were lodged at it and, and countered by barcoding. But it works reasonably well. About 95% of, of, of the animal species can be differentiated using just this stretch of DNA. And there are always going to be cases where we struggle with that, where there's hybridization or where we have new species that are forming. And these are going to require additional information. And, and most DNA barcoders use a, a variety of different information sources to actually describe new species. But that's the basis of it. The program of DNA barcoding expanded over the course of different major international campaigns. And now, um, some 18 years later, there are almost 10 million DNA barcodes housed in the um, online web repository of DNA barcoding data, and these cover 330,000 species on, that are, exist on the planet, and they have been recorded from every part of the world, from Antarctic to the, to the Arctic, and in the oceans and the tropics. And so it really is a global campaign. There are parts of the world that are better sampled, um, but it has been very, very well taken up and has a life of its own now of people generating and recording barcodes for our new species as they're described and discovered, and then recording positional information for barcode data from around the world. So the, the BOLD website, where the central repository for DNA barcode data is a wonderful resource to house this information. But one of the biggest questions in the early days of DNA barcoding was, what are you gonna do with the information once you get it? What is the point of collecting barcodes? Um, and it's just one sort of example of, of a, a really obvious way of using it, We've designed systems to identify things like agricultural pests using DNA barcodes. And so we, we designed a very high sensitivity barcoding system for this particular um, brown marmorated the stink bug, which is a globally invasive species. Um, and we can identify it robustly from even the most degraded ancient scraps of eggs cases. Um, we're able to identify um, what it is and differentiate those egg cases from other identical um, egg cases in a morphological sense and tell a farmer whether they have this particular pest in a field. So having that resource, that global repository of species that are closely related, that are morphologically similar but have different barcodes allows us to design systems that allows us allows rapid identification of specimens from even the most fragmentary forensic traces of material. So that's the sort of general application that barcoding has taken up within many different sectors. There's a lot of agricultural work with barcoding, a lot of um, border control, looking at new arrivals and invasive species. Um, but what we want to talk about is how it became a tool in ecology. And for most of my PhD work, it wasn't. It was, it was purely a tool of taxonomy and slightly a tool of phylogenetics. But there was no real ecological application of barcoding when I began my PhD. Um, and I think I'm one of the first who actually showed that we could that the, the, the database was mature enough that we could turn it into an ecological tool. Um, and it came that that transition came about largely because of this paper that was published by Kevin McCann in Nature in 2007, a few years after barcoding was really established. Um, and it's a wonderful essay. It's called Prote Protecting Biostructure, and I would recommend any student of ecology should read it. In there, Kevin McCann, who is a friend of mine, um, so I, I'm, I'm going to misquote him slightly. He said in the paper that we are focused on diversity at the cost of ignoring the network of interactions between organisms that characterize ecosystems. And so he was saying, stop just counting species. Counting species tells you nothing about how, about how ecosystems work. And to, I think what he meant was that we are so focused on diversity that we're missing the fact that it's only the first step in understanding ecosystems. And so it's not that you shouldn't count species, it's that that's only step one. 
and that the true understanding of an ecosystem comes when you understand how those species interact. You can't diagnose an interaction without knowing what's there. You must count first. But once you have counted, don't stop. You need to think about what is within that ecosystem. And this is a photograph that was sent to me during my PhD. It was taken by, by Steve and Joan Irvine. Um, and it shows a bat. I was a, I was a bat taxonomist describing new species of bats with barcodes. And this bat is chasing down a very tiny little insect. It's called a gnat. Um, it's a very tiny insect found in Canada. And what struck me about this picture was that after, at that point, you know, about five or six years of studying bats, capturing bats in the wild and spending many, many nights out, out you know, watching bats fly around, I had never seen this activity. I had never seen a bat capture an insect, its prey. And this is a fundamental problem. You know, if we can't even see them capture their prey, how are we going to know what their role in an ecosystem is? And that's where the idea of, of ecology from eDNA or traces of environmental DNA was really um, conceptualized. Because whether you're the bee contacting pollen, seeds dropped on a forest floor, which can contain DNA of the plant, but also DNA from the animal that dropped them. Um, this is a chewed uh, avocado. You've got saliva DNA from the animal that chewed it. We've also got traces of crushed up insect DNA inside a gut system, um, blood inside a mosquito. All of these are leaving behind traces of that interaction. The animal and the plant or the animal and the animal that have interacted and there's traces of that interaction if you can figure out how to access them. And so the very first project we worked on came about a bit by accident. Um, a, a, one of my best friends was studying how these bats, the Eastern red bats, learn as, as juveniles to actually manipulate prey. So how do they, they learn to use their teeth to actually hold on to an insect? And so she was studying that morphology, that, that learning ability. And she said to me, it's so frustrating. I'm studying how they manipulate prey but I don't know what the proper prey are. I don't know what to give to a bat to actually see if it can handle the prey efficiently. I'm guessing because we don't know what any of them actually eat. We can tell you they eat moths or they eat beetles, but beyond that, we don't know. So if I'm actually gonna hand them a food item and see if they can manipulate it, I'm guessing as to what they might eat. And at the time I was working on a system to develop ways of identifying species from trace material. And I, and so I said to, to my friend, Aaron, you know, have you got any of their feces? I mean, could we actually pull out fragments of insect and barcode them? And do we have enough information in the database to actually learn what they ate? And there was a new piece of the database that was being created. It was the taxonomy um, identification system. And you could stick in your piece of DNA and it would try and find a match within the, this database. So that's what we do. She, get, she did. She gave me a bunch of pieces of, of bat feces, bat guano. We pulled out some insect fragments. I sequenced the barcode gene. I had about 10 fragments of insect. I sequenced some DNA from them. I matched it to the database and I came up with 10 names of things that we knew had been eaten by that bat. And I, I took this to our mutual um, supervisor, Brock Fenton, who was a bat biologist. And I said, you know, this is what I did with barcoding because I had two supervisors. I had the bat supervisor and I had the barcode supervisor. And he was never particularly interested in barcodes. And he said, oh yeah, that, real fun. Um, so I went back to our pool of bat guano and I took a, another bunch of samples. And this time I sequenced uh, 30 fragments of DNA I matched them and I came up with, I think it was about 25 names of insects eaten by Eastern red bats. And I took it back to our supervisor and I said, I did it again. Here's the list of things eaten by these bats. He said, what did you do? I said, well, I, I took the little bits of insect under a microscope out of the bat feces and I extracted DNA and I barcoded them. And then I matched them to the database that we had for Ontario insects. And these are the names that come out as being perfect matches to what these bats are eating. He said, can you do that again? And I said, sure, you know, I, I can do it again. He said, go do it again. So I went back and I, I did a whole bunch more and I came back to him and I had 65 names of insects eaten by Eastern red bats. He said, tell me exactly what you did. 
And I said, okay, I took the, the, the bat guano, I mashed it up under a microscope, I pulled out the insect fragments, I sequenced them, and I matched them to the database. He said, do it one more time. Show me you can do it again. So I went back and I did it a fourth time, and I came back to him with 125 names of insects eaten by a population of red bats. And he said, that's really cool. And that's when I made him a barcoder. He suddenly understood what barcoding could do for his science. It could tell him what the bats had eaten. And that was something for him that was fundamentally new. And he was less interested in taxonomy than he was interested in what barcoding could do to link the predator and the prey together. And this was a, a side project of my PhD and, and it became what we did primarily for the last couple of years of my, my doctoral work. Um, you know, I, I, I did other projects related to that that became very interesting. So I had done an, a diet analysis of little brown bats and I was at a conference and I was presenting things eaten by little brown bats. And this guy came up to me afterwards and he said, I have no interest in what bats eat. I'm an, uh, I study aquatic ecology and, but he said, but when I look at your list of species, I don't see bat food, I see environmental indicators. I bet I can tell you all about the ecology of your bats based on what they're eating. And so I gave him all the lists of species that were eaten by bats and he came back to me and told me very accurately all about those, those bats and where they were foraging. Um, and this led to several big projects where we looked at bat populations all over Canada. And he would tell me things like, well, if they eat glissosomids and agripnia and ephemeralidae and pharyngea, um, these are species of insect we know are um, not tolerant to pollution or acidification. So if they're foraging for those things over water, that water has to be really, really clean, the high quality habitat. And in comparison, if they eat things like chironomids and, and the other species in these lists, these are really, really high tolerance to pollution. He said, I'll predict they're, they're foraging over waterways that are quite polluted. And we went back and actually tracked some of the things and he was quite right. He was able to tell me from the species list about the habitat that was being used by the different colonies of bats. He was able to identify things like species that are only indicative of moving water because these can cling on to the vegetation. And in fact, when we went back and checked, these are colonies that were foraging on rivers. And in comparison, we had other colonies that he was able to tell me the species they eat, they can't cling. They are unable to hold on to vegetation and therefore I think they forage over ponds or still water systems. And he was again quite right. So he was able to tell from my list of things eaten by bats where the bats were foraging. And we were able to confirm that and actually look at the habitat quality of the animals based on what they were eating. And this has led to a, a wide variety of different research projects, um, not just with bats, we work with spiders and birds and skinks and shrews and blood feeding leeches and all and pitcher plants, carnivorous plants, looking at how they interact with, with insect communities. Um, and then we expanded that into looking at blood meals and looking at seeds and pollen. And we've been able to identify all kinds of different interactions um, that are happening in ecology through the traces of DNA that are left behind. And this then scaled up towards the end of my PhD and the beginning of my postdoc, where we started to work on larger systems. So not just a diet analysis, but trying to un understand food webs. Um, and it started at the end of my PhD in one of my favorite habitats where Hernani's actually spent a number of years working as well. This is the um, Guanacaste in Costa Rica. And during my PhD, I went down there and I collected all kinds of samples, most of which we didn't have the technology to analyze at the time. But over the course of about 10 years, we developed the different systems we needed to be able to identify all the different components of this system. Um, there were 21 species of bats, which we knew how to barcode at the time. There were thousands of insects prey, which we didn't know how to barcode at the time, but we learned how to during my postdoc when, when high throughput sequencing allowed us to start looking at meta barcoding, looking at, at mixed slurries of prey, not having to pull out individual insects anymore. Um, later on, we came up with better systems to identify plants, and so we were able to look at the seeds they were dispersing. And then finally, in the last few years, looking at the ectoparasites and blood meals of those species to identify and link them all together. Um, we now use a variety of mixed methods in the field. We have acoustic and behavioral and habitat survey methods, traditional systems of, e of ecological sampling. 
but we also use a mixture of molecular techniques from traditional Sanger sequencing, one sequence from one specimen, to metabarcoding, looking at mixed diet using a variety of different markers um, that can tell us about different portions of the, the system. We've also been developing a mobile laboratory. One of my students has, has developed a way of, of collecting DNA, amplifying it and sequencing it all while we are in the middle of a jungle. And I'll show you a picture of him doing that later. Um, so he was able to do a bunch of sequencing for us without ever having to take the material back to our lab. But this original system that we put together, we, we actually built different food webs, um, three different sets of interactions, the bats and the plants, um, the parasites and the bats, and the bats and the insects that they were interacting with. And these are really different types of networks. They're very different in their structure. And we've done all kinds of fun things with this. We can do things like model what would happen if we began removing species from that network. If things went extinct, um, what would happen to the remaining species within the network. We can look at the risks associated with, with loss of species, um, what we call secondary extinctions. And this gives us measures of, of how robust the networks are. And to give you some examples of what this might look like, um, we've looked at different models of how you might things might go extinct and um, worst case scenarios and best case scenarios. It doesn't really matter to what the details of this are, but they look really different. So here is a model of what would happen to the parasites if some of the bats went extinct. And you can see the, the you can think of the green line as being sort of a null model where the bats go extinct at random. The dashed line is a best case scenario where the rare things go extinct first. And the um, black solid line is a worst case scenario where we lose the most abundant species first. And you can look at the response of which parasites would go extinct in which order. And you don't need to worry about what's actually happening, but I want you to compare the shape of this graph of parasites to one of plants, which is very, very similar. So lots of plants are specifically um, seed dispersed, have their seeds dispersed by a single bat. Lots of parasites have a single host. And so when you remove a bat, you lose that interaction with the plant or the parasite. But insects look really different. And here now it really matters in terms of, of who has a predator, what order bats go extinct. So under a best case scenario where rare bats go extinct, most insects still have a predator out there foraging for them. But if you lose a really common bat first, an abundance model, so you lose something that's very, very common suddenly goes extinct, actually a huge portion of those insects are no longer facing predation. So they've lost their the suppression of their populations. And so with insects, what the, the model of a food web is telling us is that it, it's a very different scenario depending on the order which, which things might go extinct in an ecosystem. It's very different than the dynamics we see of parasites and plants. So this being able to take apart bits of a food web at a very high resolution gives us some idea of how we can model risks associated with different effects in ecology. Um, when we put the whole food web together into one large model like this, we were looking at the different sort of functions within the ecosystem, mutualistic interactions, predatory interactions. And what we identified very early on was a very strange node right in the middle. And this has turned out to be one of my favorite in, um, bats out there. It's the common nectar bat, Glossophaga. And it led us to try and figure out what was happening because Glossophaga is the quintessential neotropical nectar bat. Those of you who are down in Brazil, um, you probably see these. If you ever see banana flowers, they're out foraging at night. So they're studied ex extensively for their ability to pollinate in different plants. But what our food web was telling us when we looked at their their guano was that there's a lot of insect DNA in their feces. And so this led us to ask the question, how are they able to do this? This is not a bat that has a particularly good sense of echolocation. So how is it actually looking like one of the top predators in the system? What's, what's gone wrong here? And so we actually, during my postdoc, did um, an extensive evaluation just of Glossophaga. We had a, a colony of them living in captivity. Um, what we know is that nectar feeding is a derived condition, so their ancestors were insectivores. And so we began looking them at them not as nectar bats, but what if we think about them as omnivores? What, what is their strategy to catch insects? And how common is this behavior? We think of them as being nectar bats. That's how they tend to be referred to in the literature. But there are occasional reports of them taking insects in different scenarios. For instance, when resources are really, really different for a period of time, maybe they can change their feeding guild. 
we set up um, sort of two parallel experiments in back in Costa Rica. We collected a lot of different fecal samples um, in Costa Rica and then in Belize um, to look and see what the general level of insectivory was amongst wild populations. And in our captive colony in Bristol, um, we took some naive bats that had never seen an insect and we hung mealworms in front of them on strings and we recorded their echolocation to see what they were actually doing when they approached something that wasn't a flower. So were they able to use echolocation in a way to capture um, insects? Out in the wild, our data suggested that um, insectivory was actually really, really common. Um, two thirds of the individuals that we collected guano from had insect DNA in their guano. We could estimate that. So it's not a rare activity. This is a relatively common activity and most of the Glossophaga do appear to, to have insectivorous abilities. What were they eating? We were able to identify they were eating diptera and coleoptera and hemiptera, but about half of what they were eating were noctuid moths. And these are moths that have ears. They should be able to hear a bat coming. And this raises a, a problem for the, uh, the neuroacoustic um, ecologists who think that bats and moths have an arms race where the moth ear is tuned to hear the bat and the bat gets much, much better at echolocation to evade the hearing of the moth. Well, now I'm throwing into the mix a bat that doesn't have particularly good echolocation and saying it's a voracious hunter of moths with ears. So we were faced with this problem of what is it that they're doing to get around the defenses of these insects? Well, it turns out they have a really interesting strategy that allows them to be good insectivores. And I'm gonna walk you through, the, through this graph. It it's, it's, looks complicated, but it's not particularly. Um, along the bottom of this graph, we have uh, the, the um, intensity of the bat echolocation. So how loud can they yell? And a, a standard insectivore is yelling up around here at about uh, 120 to 130 decibels. It's very, very loud. And along here, we have the distance where the moth or the bat can hear either the echoes of the bat's echolocation call or the returning echoes from the moth. And we can actually graph these two things and they're not quite the same. So we have an area where only the bat hears the moth. So the bat gets the return echo, but the moth's ears aren't triggered. We have an area where the moth hears the bat coming, but the echoes can't get back to the bat, they can't return. We have a, an area where they both hear each other and about an area where they can't hear each other. So this is just a, a model of how sensitive uh, the echolocation and moth ear connection is. And we can do this for um, a fairly normal um, moth or a particularly sensitive moth. At the top, what we've recorded up here is what Glossophaga was actually saying. So, this is where Glossophaga was yelling. They're actually really, really quiet compared to a standard insectivore. So if we draw this line down, they're much more less intense in their echolocation than a standard insectivore. And it turns out what is happening is they're so quiet that they get a little bit of the returning echo, but they're quiet enough they don't trigger the ears of the moth. And if we look at a, a more standard moth, so this is a particularly sensitive moth, this is a particularly unsensitive moth, then most of the moths never hear that glossophaga sound. They do hear standard insectivores, but they don't hear glossophaga. And so what's basically happening is glossophaga are whispering. They, run or they, they fly around the forest whispering until they can hear the moths, but they're not quite loud enough to trigger a response in the, the nerve cells in the ear of the moth. And so they're winning at the echolocation arms race by actually being weak echolocators. We call them now, now stealth hawkers. So they're, they're very, very quiet in their approach and the moth never hears them coming. So we have a, a good now acoustic model of how they're able to achieve insectivory without being strong echolocators. It's the opposite of the trick that most standard insectivores use, but it allows them to be very, very effective um, as insectivores in the wild. And I can actually show you a video of them um, completing this approach. So these are our naive moths um, in the um, acoustic chamber that we had. So this is, this is actually a mealworm, if you can see it hanging on a string, and that's a bat trying to chase that mealworm down, so it failed to capture it. Um, 
So this one tried to get it off the string and I tied it on too, too tightly. It couldn't get it off, but it's really, really trying, showing you that even a naive bat that has never encountered an insect knows, knows instinctively that it wants to do this. Um, sometimes when they fail to capture it, they came up with their own solution to how to eat this mealworm. So this one just eventually hung upside down and ate it off the string. What we were trying to capture was, are they capable of actually grabbing an insect in flight without stopping? Um, and we can see them here try to grab it and they'll make several attempts. This is much more like a real insectivore. So they're not hovering like they would from a flower. They're actually able to, to complete the capture. And so if we go back to this, this food web that we created, um, you know, the food web based on DNA highlighted a very unique position with, it, with the glossophaga. And then we were able to, able to follow that up with, with a real uh, ecological study of them to determine how they held this unique position within a food web. And I no longer think of Glossophaga as being a nectar bat. I think of them as being one of the most important um, omnivores in the system and probably a keystone within that system. So a keystone species. They're very, very abundant, but they're having a disproportionate effect on the, the ecology compared to their abundance. They're able to be both insectivores and pollinators they are able to disperse seeds and host parasites. They're doing all these different ecological functions and they probably meet the definition of an ecological keystone. Now, Tiago last week told you a lot about his work in Regua um, and, and he will have told you about our, our, our work in um, the fragmented system. Um, and he'll also, I think, told you a little bit about Kelly and Omar who worked on other parts of the system looking at, he looked at the bats and the plants, Omar looked at the parasites of the bats and Kelly has looked at the microbes of the parasites. Um, we've created this multi-level food web across multiple different fragments within this um, fragmented system, which is really interesting, allowing us to look at um, different meta-community structures, the different types of communities and where they live in the different fragments. And he probably told you that one of the driving explanatory um, factors about the structure of these multi-systems multi is area. So the area of fragments seems to be one of the overriding predictors of changes in the structure at all different levels of the, of the ecosystem, which is quite interesting. It suggests that microbes are responding to changes in the area of a fragment um, when you might think that they're really only tied to their host. It seems they do actually have some influence of the landscape. Um, what I want to pick up, up on from Tiago's talk last week though, is this idea that what we're recognizing now is that just because two things are present doesn't mean they will interact. And there is a growing understanding that we have to think about the potential interactions in a system. So you have the bat and you have the plant and you know they can interact, but to also measure whether or not they actually do interact. So it may be that under certain circumstances, a, a artibius will disperse those fig seeds, but under some circumstances they won't. And it's really, really important to understand when do they not perform a function that they, we know that they're capable of. And what we're looking at now is that some of these interactions are responding to landscape gradients independently of the actual ecological communities. This is really, really important because it means just knowing what's there won't tell you if the ecological function is actually being realized. So we do this by calculating something called um, the dissimilarity um, beta, which represents the difference between what they can do and what they actually do in, in a real landscape. And we can assess which landscape fa factors may contribute to this loss of interactions, even when the species are still present. Um, and what we've looked at from Tiago's data and Kelly's and Omar's is that across the different levels of the interaction, the bats and the plants, the parasites and the bats, the microbes and the parasites, we actually see that um, there's a moderate loss of those interactions in all of the fragments. And so in general, uh, somewhere between 30 and 45% of the interactions are being lost, even when the species that would normally interact are present. We know that habitat complexity predicts the loss of herbivorous interactions. So the bats change which plants they interact with based on the complexity of their habitat. But at the other levels of that ecosystem, we don't know what is causing parasites to stop interacting with bats or microbes that change their interaction with parasites. What I don't think um, 
Tiago will have talked much about is the work on the microbes, understanding what may be controlling their changes in interactions. So the take home message of this dissimilarity problem is that species interactions can react to environmental filters differently than the species themselves, which tells you that species may be present, but not actually interacting. What Kelly um, has worked on with microbes suggests that um, the microbiome of the bats, so of the bat flies, is being influenced by the species of bat fly. It's influenced by the bat family, so going down the levels of the taxonomy, the, of the, the ecological hierarchy. Um, so the, the family of bats can predict what the microbiome is, but so can the fragment area. So how does area influence microbiome to change those interactions that we don't actually see some of the interactions we would expect given the flies that are present on the bats. So one of the things she's recognized then is that it's actually changing how microbes interact with each other. So if we look at just the diversity of the microbes in the reserve land in Ragua and the non-reserve fragments, it's actually about the same. But if we look at some of the key structural differences in the microbiome community, we say that in the fragments, the non-reserve land, the modularity of the microbe net to microbe networks is actually increasing. So we're getting many smaller modules of interactions where microbes interact with a few other microbes and these ones micro with these interactions. And we don't see those little tiny interactions when we go to more pristine reserve forest. And so it seems like there's actually a change in how microbes interact with each other which may explain why we don't see them interacting with their hosts in the same way anymore. So we need to look at the, the interactions within an, um, an ecological level, which might explain why we see changes in interactions between trophic levels. And so if we come back to what Kevin McCann had written about that got me thinking about how to use DNA to start diagnosing interactions, and his statement that we needed to focus on diversity, but then move on to understanding interactions. I think we're actually now able to do that in a very fundamental way. We are starting to understand not just what lives in habitats, but how it interacts across multiple um, ecological levels, multiple trophic levels, but then how those interactions are actually changing with landscape as well. And I think that's one of the fundamental challenges that's, that's coming is to understand diversity, networks, but then the ecology of interactions, because interactions turn out to be much more complicated than just knowing who can pollinate who or who can prey on who. We need to now understand under what conditions they actually produce that interaction. When is the behavior changing with ecology? So the challenge is to integrate these sort of multi-trophic meta-community analyses, treating species and networks and interactions as separate components you have to measure, but integrate them. To recognize that all taxa are influenced by multiple biotic and abiotic stressors, but that interactions themselves are gonna to respond to landscape independently of the communities of things that are actually there. And this has profound implica uh, implications for understanding ecosystem function. So I'm going to leave with um, an idea of what I think is happening next in this field. And what's, so what's next? So one is mobile technology. This is Omar, um, one of my PhD students who's just completed his PhD. And one of the things that he did during his, his thesis was um, actually design a system where he could take DNA sequencing technology out into the field. This is us in the middle of a Belize forest um, in a little sort of um, open air classroom. He's actually sequencing DNA from animals that we caught the night before. And he was able to do that without a lab. So he just with what he could carry in a suitcase, um, he could perform DNA sequencing um, using uh, mobile sequencing technology, which is pretty fun fundamentally fantastic. It needs a lot of refinement to make it actually usable, but it is it is happening. Um, the next big area that's been developing wildly in the last sort of five years is environmental DNA biomonitoring. This is Jane Hallam. Um, she's one of my PhD students who works on studying fish populations in um, the largest water system in the UK, the Thames River that runs through London. Um, and she's been looking at how we can study the, the populations of, of the fish based on the DNA they leave behind in water. And the last thing I want to present is we're 
the field of eDNA is going. So I was writing a report for the UK government on how we should use DNA in biomonitoring going forward. And I was talking about environmental DNA as being uh, this new and wonderful thing. And I was able to tell them about eDNA in soil and water, in rain, in blood meals that I think Rosie will talk to you about next week, in snow, and even in honey, people are accessing DNA that's being left behind to understand. But no one had mentioned air. And I went looking for air. And there were lots of people writing about DNA probably is carried on the air, but no one had actually looked. The best I could find was were a few people who'd collected dust in dust traps and found plant DNA in it. But no one had actually taken an air sample and asked, is there any DNA in it? And so we designed an experiment just in the last few months in my lab um, where we asked that question, is there any DNA in the air? And if we can capture air samples, can we identify species of animal from the air? And the first experiment we've actually done was looking at whether or not we could detect, these are naked mole rats. They live in a colony in one of our animal care facilities. And we took DNA from within their colony chambers. So this is one of the chambers where they can get really close. We also took DNA, uh, air samples from out into the main room. And we asked a really simple question, can we extract DNA from the air in their chambers where they spend a lot of time, but also out in the general environment of the room where their, their chambers exist and identify naked mole rats. And I'm gonna show you if it'll let me play it. Um, I'm hoping that I can show you this video. Uh, it's not gonna show just right away. Hang on one second. I will change my shared screen for you. Oh, Hernani, it's not letting me change what I'm sharing. Try one more time. I think we got it now. Nope, it does not want me to share my other screen. Try one more time. There we go. So I'm gonna try and share a video. The world is really an ocean of DNA. It's in the water, the soil, and now we know it's in the air. This is a huge source of information for us to learn about the planet. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Clare. I'm a molecular ecologist at Queen Mary University of London, and that means I'm interested in using DNA to solve ecological problems. We're all shedding bits of DNA all the time. We call this environmental DNA or eDNA. And because you don't need a visible piece of hair or tissue to collect it, it's become really common to filter eDNA from water to monitor fish populations or search for invasive species. Other people have collected DNA from snow and soil. What we wanted to know was whether we could filter eDNA from the air to track the presence of terrestrial animals. My background was working with bats and in some really hard to reach places. One of my co-authors, Dr. Chris Fox, works on burrowing animals. We were interested in whether we could use this air DNA as a way to assess what species were present in a burrow or a cave when we could not easily see or capture them. Lots of scientists had speculated about this, but we could not find any published case where someone had actually tested for animal DNA in the air. Well, our paper describes really the first proof of this concept. We have experienced filtering eDNA from water, so we used a similar method, sucking air samples through a really fine filter and trying to trap air DNA. We sampled air from inside the artificial burrows of some naked mole rats, and then in the room where the burrows are housed. 
We then extracted the air DNA from these filters and we sequenced a piece of DNA which would let us identify species from that sample. We compared this DNA against reference databases and identified the naked mole rats, but also humans who care for them. We found the naked mole rats exactly where we expected them to be in the burrows, but also in the room, which shows that the DNA is moving away from the source. We also found human DNA in all of our samples, and this was something we had not anticipated. At first, we considered this a contaminant, but what we realized is it opens up some interesting questions about how this could be used in archaeology or criminal forensics. The biggest challenge we anticipate for future applications of this methodology is the potential that the air DNA is going to be diluted. In a large space, it might be so diluted that we can't detect it efficiently. We'll need to suck lots of air through a filter to accomplish this, but in a smaller space, we think it might work really well. I think this is going to be really interesting to scientists who work on animals that are just hard to get to. Roosting in tree hollows, underground, small, hard to reach caves. It could let us monitor the species present without actually having to disturb them or get really close. However, the unexpected side effect of collecting human DNA is also really interesting. And we're now discussing what we can do with this sort of technology. Our study suggests we may have another tool we can use in our toolbox to measure biodiversity. We're desperately in need of ways to monitor species on a planetary scale. We think what we have done can be done in remote areas and in hard to reach places, opening up new ways to monitor species. But we are aware there are other really serious applications of the technology. Human DNA in the air might give us new options in forensic analysis, but the same method we use should also be able to identify microbes and pathogens, pollens and fungal spores. It might help us map the transmission of infectious diseases or allergens, for example. The main question we're now working on is how far can this air DNA travel and how big of a space can we be in and still detect the species that are present? We really need to expand the study to consider all the factors which might help preserve or degrade that air DNA. That will help us understand the potential as a tool. I really hope other people will go out and try this. Help us narrow down the methods that are going to work and the conditions that are going to make this a really useful tool. This is really exciting new development. I look forward to seeing what comes next. Okay, I hope the sound worked on that. If it doesn't, I'll post the link and you can, it's just on YouTube, you can watch the video. Um, but I'll stop there. So, so we've just recently been able to demonstrate for the first time that we can extract DNA from the air. And I think that opens up a huge new um, area of research that will allow us to speed up our method of biodiversity monitoring. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that field develop in the same way that aquatic DNA has taken off in the last few years. So I'll stop there at the 50 minute mark and I will be happy to jump over to the uh, Google Hangout chat room with uh, Hernani to field any questions. Um, and if and he can let me know whether the sound worked on that or not, um, but we can always post it later. Thank you very much for the invitation and I look forward to meeting some of you live on the other room.